Hello, ladies. Welcome. Parshas Vayigash. Uh, this is a really powerful lesson, so I'm just giving you a little warning. Um, before we get to the lesson, I wanted to share something with you that I just saw that is just so amazing to me that I want to give it over because as we know, the last few Parshios have been a process of Yosef going down to Egypt and that was the beginning of the entire exile. We spoke about this last week. And so Yosef went down to Egypt, followed eventually by the Shvatim and his father. And eventually that created the, the possibility for the Jewish people to be enslaved in Egypt, uh, which we know of as, of course, the first and I would say also the archetype, archetypal, uh, I think there's a better way of saying that, um, exile. The first of the four, and also we know that the the final eg exile is going to mirror the first. So this is all very significant, and I saw just such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, I'm going to actually share my screen today, so we're getting a little fancy here. Let's see how this works. Um, I'm going to go here first, and the other slide is for the, the bulk of the Dvar Torah. I wonder if it would work for me to do like slideshow like this so you could see it. There we go. Okay. So in Bereshith, um Perik 39, the first Pasuk, um, I think it was Parshas Vayeshev. Um, is it Parshas Vayeshev? Yeah, I think it was Parshas Vayeshev. So a couple weeks ago. Uh, yes, Vayosef, Vayosef Hurad. Do you see the word Hurad here? I don't know if you could see my, um, look at that getting fancy. Hurad. Yosef um, Hurad Mitzrayma. And that word means like Yared, uh, Yerida, right? Like a Yerida is a descent. So going down. So Yosef went down or was brought down, which is why this is um a fan, like a different grammar, because he was brought down to Mitzrayim. Um, and Potiphar bought him. Um, and everything went from there, correct? Everything went from there. But it, the beginning of the entire story of the exile of the Jewish people throughout history, us included, today included, began with the Yosef Hurad Mitzrayma. Yosef was brought down to Mitzrayim. Now, um, how do I stop annotating? Here we go. So the Midrash, I just heard this from the words of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a six and a half minute video that I, I posted on my group. And I very recommend uh, seeing it for yourself because I'm only giving you a tiny snippet. Um, but the Rebbe points out that the Midrash connects this these words to a Pasuk from Tehillim because it's a, it's a the Lashon of Hurad. Why is it using that, um, that wording in particular? that he went down, it's connected with the word vayered in Tehillim 72, Pasuk 8, vayered, which is, and he reigned and he conquered and he controlled miyam ad yam, from sea to sea, umi nahar ad afse aretz, and from the river until the ends of the earth. And this Pasuk is referring to um, the times of, it was twofolded, I'm forgetting, I believe the times of um, perhaps the first temple, Shlomo Melech, and I am forgetting that that point, but it's, but it's also referring to uh, the times of Mashiach, that the Jewish people will reign from sea to sea, from river to the ends of the earth. So hidden in this descent into Egypt, the very beginning of exile is this hint towards the, the goal of it all, the purpose of it all, in which the, the Jewish people will be, um, will be able to be a light unto the nations and, um, and teaching the world as we are meant to be from one from sea to sea, literally. So obviously this, you know, I don't even have to say it, but this 
echoes from the river to the sea. They, they, it means something. It means something. I also am going to be posting another video that I saw this morning, which is unbelievable, um, about the significance of iron. Why is it called iron swords? There is incredible significance in what iron means throughout the Torah, and especially in light of the uh, third Beis HaMikdash, that iron will play a special role. So all these things, again, are meant to make us realize, take us out of ourselves for a minute. And just remember, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute, um, and make us remember, help us remember that really, really deep things are going on here. You know, there's there's our experience and we get caught up in experience and then we also get caught up in our daily life and we like we have to like go back and forth between like, wait, I just have a life to live and like regular things, you know, from before the war and then going back to like, wait, there's also a war happening and we're like constantly you know, trying to balance those two. Uh, but just to sometimes zoom out and remember, there's some really deep spiritual things going on here that please God, may it reveal itself so clearly and so immediately so that tomorrow's fast of Asara Bateves, um, one of the four fasts mourning the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, should not have to be. As we know, eventually, eventually, hopefully right now, immediately, today, tomorrow, um, with the coming of Mashiach, the days of fast, Thing for the morning of the, the destruction of the base of Mikdash will be turned into days of joy. So please, God, may we see miracles upon miracles so that this happens already tomorrow and we will be dancing in the base of Mikdash um, and see, yes, from, from river to river, from, from sea to sea, um, what that really means. Okay, so that was just a little, you know, you know that I like to to share these ideas. Um, but the the main Devar Torah that I want to share is one that I just find is very powerful in terms of our, our own inner work and being able to uh, take ownership of things, challenges that come our way and challenges within ourselves, within our makeup, how Hashem made us, and taking ownership of that uh, rather than playing victim, rather than um, blaming on other people and rather than just waiting for things to change on their own. So what's the, that lesson from? I'm going to pull up another machine, screen share, uh, this time from Parshas Vayigash. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the other slide. How do I do that? Ah, here we go. Okay, Parshas Vayigash. So we have in, um, we have Vayigash, I love Yehuda. So Yehuda pleads Yosef, uh, who he doesn't know at that point, that is Yosef, pleads to save Binyamin um, because the goblet was, was found in Binyamin's sack at the end of last week's Parsha. So all the Shvatim are brought back to Yosef, to the viceroy of Egypt, um, as they knew him. And he says that he wants to keep Benjamin as a slave. And as we know, Yehuda took responsibility for Benjamin. He told his father, Yaakov, I take personal responsibility for Benjamin. I will not allow this. Um, I will not allow anything to happen to him. So he begs the this leader of, of Egypt to release Benjamin and take him instead. And when you when Yosef sees the loyalty of the brothers to his brother, Benjamin, he sees the rectification, the tikkun, the teshuva of their past misdeeds, of the way they treated him. And they see and he sees that they really have had a change of heart and they really do um they really do act differently and um, they have done teshuva and he can't take it anymore. He can't take this game that he's been playing with them, this hiding who he really is and he reveals himself to them. Um, some of the dialogue that happens then we're gonna touch upon at the end of this year, but I'm gonna start it off with how a few took him into that. Yosef and Binyamin <sighs> embrace. And Vayipol, the Pasuk says, Vayipol al-Tzavarei Binyamin Achiv. 
and he fell on his on the neck of his of his brother Binyamin on the on his brother's neck. Vayefk, and he cried. Yosef cried. Uvinyamin bacha, and Binyamin cried al tzavarav on his neck. So in this pasuk we have Yosef is crying on Binyamin's neck, and Binyamin is crying on Yosef's neck. And Rashi tells us something. What are they crying about? So the first one, I brought them here. So Yosef is crying on Binyamin's neck. Why? It's actually the timing is, is interesting with Asara Beteves and, and mourning the destruction of the Besa Mikdash. Um, and thinking about ultimately the third Besa Mikdash. Um, so why is he crying? He's crying that there were two uh, Beis Hamikdashes, temples in in Binyamin's uh, land, in his portion of land in Israel, which is Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is part of, as we know, Eretz Yisrael was divided. Um, the land was divided that each of the Shvatim had a portion of the land that was that Shevet's portion. Um, and Binyamin's portion is Yerushalayim. And of course, in Yerushalayim will be the Beis HaMikdash, the first, the second, and ultimately the third. And so Yosef is crying on Binyamin's neck about the future destruction of the two temples in his portion. So then why is Binyamin crying on Yosef's neck? Well, Rashi tells us that Binyamin is crying on Yosef's neck al Mishkan Shiloh. Before the temple was built, there was the the, the Mishkan, the, not the Mishkan in the Midbar, but a um, a temporary a temporary temple which was a Mishkan in Shiloh. So before the Beis Hamikdash was built in Yerushalayim, there was a Mishkan in Shiloh, and this was in Yosef's territory, and and that would also be destroyed. So Binyamin is crying on Yosef's neck to mourn the destruction of the Mishkan Shiloh that will in the future be in Yosef's territory. So I'm going to stop sharing. The Lubavitch Rebbe asks a question on this. So if they in the future will have this destruction in their territory, why aren't they crying for themselves? Why don't they cry for their own loss, their own destruction? the terrible things that happen in their territory. How come they're crying for the other? And the answer is incredibly powerful. When something happens to another person, we're often, we often want to change them. We wanna help. We wanna help them fix the situation and change them. And yet, what do we know? We can't change another person. So anything that occurs in another person's territory, there's not much we can do to assist them. At the end of the day, even if we give them advice, it's probably unwarranted. And B, even if we give it to them, it's up, ultimately up to them to do something about it. What can we do when it comes to the loss of somebody else's? somebody else's loss, we can cry with them. We can console them. We can empathize with them. Ultimately, that is the only thing we can do for them other than maybe daven for them, but that's also the crying. We can cry with them, cry to Hashem and cry with them, hold their tears, empathize with them, feel their pain. But for myself, Yes, sometimes crying is an important emotion, an important, an important expression of emotion. Sometimes it allows us to soothe our feelings or release some tension. And there's a time and place to cry. But sometimes it turns into, it can turn into bemoaning, wallowing, sitting in my own troubles, escapism, avoidance, Self-pity, this wallowing, bemoaning and self-pity could lead ultimately to depression because it's stuckness. It's not action. It doesn't actually change anything. So if there is something 
in my territory, in my world, in my domain, in my land, in my life that needs change, this lesson is teaching us, okay, you might have cried a few tears, but at some point you gotta quit the crying and do something because only you have the power to change yourself. As opposed to, again, crying for another person, that is empathetic. That is comforting, consoling, and ultimately the only way that we truly can help them. You see, we can't, as we said, change another person's situation and circumstances. We can only listen and empathize and, and validate and be there for them. And that's why each of the brothers would cry for the other. But when it came to their own territory, their own challenges, they wouldn't cry because they knew there was something they needed to do about it. Regarding the destruction of the temple and Benjamin's territory, he has to do his own inner work, his own spiritual rectification and figuring out what he needs to do to prevent that from happening or to rectify it's happening. Yosef, some, something that happened in his territory, he's gonna figure out what he needs to do about that. So they're not crying for themselves because that's a lack of change, but rather they're crying for the other. This idea of ownership, ownership of my territory, my part, where I can change, where I can grow. This is an incredible lesson. And I want to add a little bit about this. You see, when I have a challenge, a, a, whether it's um, a challenge that comes my way, uh, a personality trait, a um, my life circumstances, right? Our challenges, our personal challenges. We don't want to wait for something or someone else to come and change us because we know ultimately we're the only ones who can change ourselves. So sometimes people wait for inspiration or for someone to help you out um, or for, you know, the right moment to happen and that like, okay, I'm, I'm waiting for that moment that like things will change. Or what we do is we cry and we bemoan and we self-pity ourselves, which again, that wallowing, as we said, can lead to this stuckness of, and depression. But rather, we're meant to take action and do something. So this idea from the beginning of the Parsha, this, um, this, this Pasuk in the Parsha is actually very connected to another piece that Yosef teaches his brother, brothers. Because there's no power in blame. There's no power when we look to others and say, that's why I'm in trouble. When I have my challenges, and I'm looking for others. My mother is 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 here with us and um on the virtual recording. And um she always taught me when you're pointing your finger at somebody, you're pointing three at yourself. And when I taught this to my students, one of them said, and one's pointing to Hashem. <laughs> I said, Yeah, you know, I like that. I like that. We could always, you know, a little, a little bit towards Hashem. But uh even so, there's no power in blame. As long as we are blaming, we're waiting for others to change me, I remain a victim. 
I'm powerless. This is happening to me. This is, this is, there's nothing I can do. I'm wallowing. I'm crying for my own problems, which is again, a state of powerlessness. But rather when I can look inward and look at what's in my territory, meaning what is in my control? What is something that I can do with the situation that Hashem gave me? What is my part here? A little bit of ownership, owning, even a little bit of how I got here. And yes, it could be that something that happened to me is, is, is really out of my control and it happened, it happened to me. But when we get stuck in things happening to me, I'm stuck in victimhood. It's very empowering to try and figure out where can I take ownership of this challenge? Where is a part that I could take responsibility for? Not to victim blame, God forbid. Not to blame the victim, but rather to empower. Because as long as I'm a victim, we all know that's a, that's a terrible place to be. That's a, a powerless place to be. But if I can find a little piece, a little, little piece of my part here, something that I can take ownership of, something that I can take responsibility for, something that I can change, or even better, something that I can grow in. So maybe something happened to me, but how can I use this as an opportunity for growth? That is so empowering. And that is why Yosef and Benjamin didn't bother crying for themselves because they understood that if I am met with a challenge in my world, that is an opportunity for my growth. We call this um, in relationship, I'm a relationship coach. Um, we call this divine design. Divine design is, is means that Hashem designed this challenge for my growth. Every challenge I am met with is God orchestrating the entire world from the moment of creation and every aspect of your life to create this opportunity in front of you, this situation, this challenge in front of you as an opportunity for your growth. And ultimately that's a gift to us because when we grow, we expand ourselves and we, we take ourselves out of the limitations that we thought we had. I thought I end here. I can't grow any pa any further past here. This is this is who I am, right? <laughs> Take it or leave it. But when we're challenged, we're forced to grow or we're given an opportunity to grow. And growing is an expansion of self that allows us to go past our limitations, which is the ultimate geula. That is the the experience of redemption. There's the the final redemption. And then there's the personal redemption in each of us where we go out of our own limitations. That's what Yetzias Mitzrayim means. Mitzrayim is Metzar. It's a, it's a um, boundary. It's a, it's a limit. It's a border. Um, that's what it means. And Yetzias Mitzrayim is going beyond leaving Yetzia, going out of, leaving our limitations that we, that we, think of ourselves as, as we put on ourselves or um, that we that we had before. We're going past those. So this idea of divine design, that any place we find ourselves in life, we can either view it as this happened to me, I'm a victim, or we can view it as this is from Hashem and Hashem designed this challenge for my growth. Where do we learn this from most beautifully? Who taught us this most beautifully in the Torah? Yosef himself. 
in this week's parsha, just a few psukim uh, before the one that we brought, where when Yosef reveals himself to his brothers, they take a step back. They're shocked, but they're also enveloped with shame. They're afraid, and they're also incredibly, incredibly um, shameful of what they did, of selling Yosef to slavery, of how they treated him. And now they're confronted by him, and he reveals himself to them. And his response to them is unbelievable. He says, don't be sad. Hashem sent me here to save life. What does that do? That is telling them, this is not from you. This was God's plan for me. God wanted me to go down to Egypt and by an incredible turn of events, to become viceroy of the entire empire, thus saving not only Egypt and not only Yaakov's family, his family back in Eretz Yisrael, but also the whole world from famine. God sent me here for a purpose. This is my divine mission. I was meant to be here. And nothing you could have done or not done would have changed that. I remember a teacher once uh, discussing this with um, my class back when I was in high school. And he wasn't discussing this in particular. He was saying, if somebody hurts you, do you get, ang why, do you get angry at them? And I was like, of course. They chose, right? The whole Bechira Chavshas thing, right? It's their free choice, their free will. They hurt me. But why is it that we know that the that the um, Gemara teaches us that avod uh, chaos, anger, is compared to avodazara? So, but don't I have a right to be angry at a person who hurts me? How is that avodazara idol worship? Because when we attribute anything that happens to me to another human being, that's idol worship. That is saying that Hashem is not in control. That person is in control. That person decided to hurt me. My life circumstances is because of that person. Or those things that, that or it's it's more effect, like this blame, this victimhood, this resentment. That person hurt me. That is idol worship. Why? Because the truth of the matter, the deeper truth of the matter is that everything that happens to me is from Hashem. And so if Hashem created this circumstance in which somebody hurt me in some way, I can separate that completely from the person and look at the opportunity of growth or you know whatever the challenge presents me with. Look at the opportunity of growth that is between me and Hashem. What about that person? That's between him and God. It's not my business. What the, what the person did and what the person chose to do, the fact that that person chose to hurt me, that is completely between them and Hashem. But the fact that I got hurt is from Hashem. Now, this sounds so like, Lofty, like how can we actually live like that? But we see Yosef is really living this way. Yosef is, this is what he's teaching us. He's teaching us, you think you sold me into slavery. That's what God intended for me. What you did is between you and Hashem. You know, like you guys will figure it out. You do your tissue, but I don't, I don't have any resentments. Could you imagine Yosef not having a resentment against his brothers? So this, again, is something that is meant to empower us in our lives to view any situation in which we're feeling resentment, anger towards other people, and any sense of victimhood, whether it's from another person or just my life circumstances. Going from this, you know, the, uh, they 
did this to me or even this is hap this happened to me two hashem intended for this to be where is my growth here how can i take ownership of my territory so again this is a really um deep reality to live in and that's why um um I'm just putting a plug out there for coaching because coaching is very helpful um, or speaking with people, um, whatever people help you process things in your life to retain this mindset of divine design and of ownership, of looking at myself rather than blaming somebody else. And of course, we know the flip side of that is when it comes to another person's pain, another person's challenges, another person's suffering. We're not meant to do that whatsoever. We're meant to cry and beg Hashem and daven and, and put our foot down and be like, this is enough, enough suffering in the world. Hashem, how can you let this happen? When it comes to another person's pain, we're empathetic. We are validating. We're crying with them. We're feeling their pain so, so real um, in such a real way that as if it's our own, Yosef and Binyam crying for each other. We're never meant to justify another person's suffering. When it comes to our own challenges, however, that mindset can get us very stuck. And there's no growth in being stuck. So when it comes to our own challenges, we see them as Hashem's invitation for us to grow. Ladies, May our growth happen in only good, positive, revealed ways, um, because we can grow. Um, we can grow in all sorts of ways, but um, may may them be may they be pleasant growth, and um, may we take the opportunities that we have in our lives to own up um, to our part with compassion for ourselves, also for our experience, um, but with 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 a mindset of growth and um, and dignity and empowerment. Have a beautiful Shabbos and may Mashiach be here before we need to fast tomorrow. Bye-bye.